So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the decision criteria side of things. It overlaps a bit with what you've heard with Priscilla, so I'll blast through those slides faster. I also incorporated some of the decision, decision support from modelling stuff that we didn't get to the other day. So basically my experience of uh, fisheries and coastal management is a bit like how two-year-olds share toys. If it's bright and shiny, it belongs to them. If it's broken, it's someone else's problem. Okay, so you have to think about how you deal with those kind of clashing objectives when you're trying to deal with indicators for supporting decision-making rather than just recording what's going on. And there's lots of different ways of doing that. Um, Multi-criteria analysis, structured decision-making, and there's lots of things that come out of structured decision making like management strategy evaluation where you use models to test the indicators like we heard this morning with the marine traffic index. All of those though require indicators that you can link to performance measures. So the way that these work is typically in the adaptive management cycle where you have some higher order objectives, you then decide what you're going to do in management, you implement that management, you see if it's doing what you expected, and then in the longer double loop, you then can update that in future objectives. This part is the key. This is where the indicators and decision criteria are important because you're checking that the management or the action you've taken actually is doing what you thought it was or is having any impact. So one of the biggest... So we heard this morning about a lot of debates that happen in the science space, either within the literature or between science and the outside world, so to speak. Marine protected areas and the role of marine protected areas are one of these. And part of the reason that debate sits there is because some places people have gone look for attribution of the effects. And other places there's been a little bit of a faith of if it's in place it's working and has the desired effect without going back and actually checking. And so that's a big part for conservation overall. They tend to spend less time checking that their action has actually delivered, even at a managerial level, than you see in fisheries, which is why the tension can develop. But you have to use indicators well. So this is an example that Keith Sainsbury uses. There's the expectations of how you communicate that information. So we've got this balloonist, and he's flying along, and he's actually lost his phone over the side, so he has no idea GPS-wise where he is. So he sees someone on the ground, so he comes down and says, where am I? And the guy gives him an exact altitude and an exact grid reference. And the guy's like, yeah, you're a scientist. That's not helpful, I'm still lost. I have no relationship to where I am. And this guy says, yeah, and you're a manager because it's still my fault and I gave you accurate information. <laughs> and it's that, it's that misconnection between what's useful information and what we feel comfortable with science is in delivering. You have to make the interpretation set. If this guy had said, you're 20 metres outside Australia's Parliament House, and the guy knows he's in Canberra, he probably has a better idea of where he is than giving him an exact good record. And that's something that people appreciate more broadly um, as they move into using indicators for management support. So Jamil Samuri and a group of people in Seattle have done a lot of work in this area. Uh, particularly in the form of integrated ecosystem assessments along the coastline and bring all those pressures together. And the key part is that you've got to have a management goal defined so that you can see if the indicator is actually delivering information relevant to that goal. And getting that management goal defined can actually be a really, really hard part of the process. Uh, but it's really important because you can't have information content without it. So you have a reference point this is the indicator that you can actually uh, follow through time. This is the reference point that you're hopefully aiming at. And it's the difference between that indicator and the reference point that tells you your performance. So if the indicator is above the target, great. If it's less than the target, it's not so great. Okay, so the, the issue that we have in climate change is also that the reference points may be shifting. But that's not a discussion for today. It's just something to keep in mind. That that's why you need that double learning loop, because you might have to go back and revise it. So you've got the different kinds of indicators. You've got stuff that, as scientists, we often do, where we're just trying to describe the system and how it might have changed, or how the trends might have expressed themselves, as well as real change through time. They're used to understand things, and there's literally hundreds of them. So back when I did my postdoc, Again, when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, there was 400 ecological indicators 
suggested in the literature then. It's grown a bit since then, but there's been less refinement to down to what you can use in management. Management indicators actually take an extra step. They take their information and they say, okay, this might be what the world's doing, but how does that compare to where we want it to be? And it's that extra step that's the critical one. It's also important to get uh, participation in the definition of those indicators so people can accept why they have information content and because they might come up with other ones that are useful as well. There can be some perverse outcomes that way, but as long as you're aware that that's a possibility, you can find really useful ones. So an example of a fun indicator that was used quite broadly in the United States for a while, I think it's still used in one particular lake, was they wanted to get on top of water quality but commu communicate that to the community. So what they did, they had the idea of the Seki deck, the Seki disc, so you drop the white disc, how far can you see it? But what they did was they gave the mayor a pair of white shoes. And how far into the lake did he have to walk before he couldn't see his shoes in the lake? And they, actually the community got behind it and they would all come down to see the mayor walk into the lake. There was, funnily enough, an evolution of taller bears through time as the water got cleaner. <laughs> um, the shorter bears had a resistance to being involved. Uh, but it was a good example of how to have information content in an indicator that the community got behind. You do have to allow for all those different parts, uh, particularly when you're in the coastal space, you have to have indicators or sets of indicators that between them describe the complicated system. So no one indicator is likely to do it. That's particularly because you've got to expose the trade-offs that can happen between indicators. So there was a paper I was finishing yesterday and it showed that ecosystem-based management can deliver heaps more than single species of management except when it came to employment. There was no iteration of it that I could find where there was more employment from EBFM than from single species in the model we will play. You also need to be clear about uncertainty and that can be really difficult in terms of communicating that across to other people. So we can, as scientists we deal with uncertainty quite a lot but the communication of that can be quite difficult if you're also trying to do it in a way that's easy for people to appreciate like in report cards and green, yellow, red colouring, that kind of stuff. The stippling works fine for scientists most managers just ignore that there's any dots on the picture at all. You also need to uh, prioritise information needs. So drowning people in hundreds of indicators doesn't work. So, for instance, in Alaska, they follow 400 indicators of ecosystem state to, to tell the Fisheries Council, but they have a one-page sheet that sort of captures the top headlines each year, almost like a Twitter feed of what the indicators are saying, and that's what's been most effective in communicating that. You also want your indicators to have clear patterns. So, for instance, you're after linear interactions rather than non-linear. So, if you've got this kind of world, you can say, if my indicator's down here, then the thing I am actually care about. So, that's something else I should point out. Indicators are not always exactly what you care about. They're correlated with what you care about, but they're easier to calculate and track. There's often inherent properties of a system like resilience that you can't directly measure. So you want indicators that are telling you about that. And you want this, react, this relationship to be uh, as clear as possible. So if you've got a value down here, you're pretty clear what the attribute value is and whether it's desirable or not, and equally up here. But if you're on this curve and you have a value for the indicator, you don't know whether it's good or it's bad. So you need to have clear relationships with what you're connecting with. You also have to have something that's easily communicated um, and has direct it can be easily interpreted. So this is a lot of what Priscilla had already said. And in the old days, again with the dinosaurs on here, the canary in the coal mine was a saying that was really common, like because they used to literally take canaries down the coal mines. If the canary died, the air quality wasn't good, and so they could leave. And that was a really good indicator. It was clear, it communicated the message, it got you out. Unfortunately, I was presenting this to a group of undergraduates the other day and to my own children, they were like, canary in the coal mine? What the fuck? <laughs> so, we have, you have to update your analogies and your indicators as information content changes. So they had no idea about coal mines and canaries. Um, but there's other options. So for instance, when I worked on Ningaloo, I did have to go to the hospital a couple of times because I'm very accident prone. And when you arrive at the Ningaloo hospital, they have to deal with so many foreign tourists in this tiny little town where they, have, they can only speak English and they speak a very strong Australian dialect. Um, so they had this 
you get handed a piece of paper, and on that piece of paper you have to circle which of these that you are. And there's ten different kind of gradations of happiness, and that's how sad you are, and that's how much pain you're in, and that's how you get prioritised as to go into the emergency department. If you circle this one, you get in faster than if you circle that one, funnily enough. But it was easy and it could go across different groups very quickly. You also have to think about how you pull together multiple indicators, because you will need to deal with a suite of indicators to communicate what's going on for something as complicated as an ecosystem. But you have to be able to do it in a transparent way, in a repeatable way. And so you get into questions of waiting. So, for instance, in the paper I was finishing yesterday, the reviewer had said, well, you didn't weight them. Why have all the indicators got exactly the same weight? And for me, that was because we weren't trying to prejudge how people would interpret the different objectives for the ecosystem. So a flat weighting where the reviewer, the readers, could decide what their own personal weightings were was the most appropriate. In other cases where there's either agreement from those using the indicators or there's you know, there's other evidence to say, okay, this is actually a more fundamentally important aspect of the system than this one, then you can start getting to weightings. But that really has to be a, a long-term conversation because getting agreement can be really tricky because different groups have different objectives. There's also the issue with composite indicators that um, Priscilla already highlighted. So the Ocean Health Index is a great index. It gives you a really fast idea of what's happening where but it can hide a lot of detail of what's happening in the different components. And composite indicators typically have to be teased back out again to make sure that they're not getting everything's fine in the middle answer, well, one thing's doing really well and one thing's just going down the pan, as they say in Australia. Uh, not doing very well is probably the best way of translating that. Um, yeah, so you've got to be on top of all what the different parts are doing. So the, the payoff though is if you can actually get the successful use of indicators, you can really have really clear decision making that takes the blame and the tension out of it because you've got a clear decision, you've got a clear set of rules to follow and you've got an indicator that can feed into that process. You can also have a way of repeating it so that there's really complex op options can be consistently thought through by lots of different people with different backgrounds. And that requires transparency, it requires the agreement beforehand. So that's when it becomes decision criteria, there's a lot of involvement with talking to the people who are going to be using it to make sure that it remains useful. And there's already some of you in this room that have had to do that, with the reporting in the Mexican fisheries around the use of the zoning and that kind of stuff. So there's some of your other uh, classmates, for want of a better word here, you should talk to them about the, the experience they've had on that project. So we do need these reference points though because it's really important to know both whether you're at the place you want to be or whether there's an absolute limit that you have to avoid. So we've just heard about tipping points. And a lot of these reference limit points are you're trying to avoid being near a tipping point. So over the course of my life, you've, particularly in Australia, it's gone from you just know not to walk next to the cliff to enough people have fallen off the cliff that they now put fences on all the cliffs. And that's effectively because they're trying to warn you that you're approaching a tipping point. So they've got a target, which is you don't die. They have a target zone where they prefer you to be, so they've moved the fence further away for the idiots who then want to step over the fence and still have a look. So yeah, you've, got your, you've got your cliff that you're going to fall over, you've got the target that you want to be at, and you've got the limit that you want to avoid. And the same is true in ecosystems. Finding those limit reference points for ecosystems has been a tough task to do. It's very system dependent. And while there's some universal ones that people like to use in fisheries, it is something that needs to be tailored to the question and the system that you're, you're interested in. So basically the whole idea behind the use of indicators and reference points for management though is the assumption that there's often a linear or at least a, you know, a fairly monotonic uh, direction to having an un unimpacted system the system that you can use a little bit without degrading it to the point of system breaking down, a place where you get a warning to say, hey, you're going into danger zone, the edge of that cliff, and then you fall off. You don't want to be down here. So you want, some people aim for specific targets here, but it's becoming clear that you might need to actually use trends and reference directions so that you're 
you want to, so you can either have a specific value and relate it to what the values are at these target points, or if you're using reference directions, you want a positive direction. You want your trend to always be pointing up this way, like this. Or if you're in this zone, you want it to be going backwards and forwards. You don't want to be seeing one that's going in that direction because that indicates that you're not around where you want to be. And that's about as best as you can do for a whole system. Oops. So in defining some of those indicators and reference points, you do need to think about the shape of how you, the level of pressure, how that response, what the response shape is. So ideally you have a linear one, they're the easiest to understand. This one can be a bit more proportionary, it's highly responsive, so you might get some false alarms early on, but you know you you always know that you're going to have warning in plenty of time. Sometimes you're stuck with a slow response one, which doesn't tell you much is happening until it's almost too late, but at least it is giving you some forewarning. But if you can understand which one you're in, you can build that into your precaution. So it might be that under the linear and high, you set your, your limit reference point over here, but at the slow, you'd actually set it a bit earlier because to give you that extra time to realise something's happening. Now, how do you go about setting those reference points? Well, you can have a theoretical relationship, which is often what happens in the physics world. But for the ecology and the socio-ecological world, it's a bit messier. So what you tend to do is look through a time series and say, what's a desirable value in the past that, that you want to aim for instead, or a desirable value in space? So if there's an untouched area or an area that's in the state that you like, you use it as your default to compare against. And again, Jamil has uh, gone through this in great detail. And here's some examples of what that might look like. So this is a time series of the number of fish and diversity from uh, the North Sea. And so they were looking for the percentage of fish that were greater than 30% in the surveys. And so that they could see that the state they're after was in the 1920s, not so much today. So then they could go back and unpack the other bits of information they had from the 1920s so that they could start defining what they wanted for that system and what their reference points were. Similarly for the diversity, the diversity in the past was much higher than today. The other alternative was to look in space. So they had different parts of the North Sea had been impacted to different levels at that point. So they could look through space to see if they were also getting consistent bits of information. And it did show that percent fish was actually something they could still get clear signals on, whereas the diversity was a bit more complex. So in the end, they followed percent fish rather than diversity because they knew from the past that they were correlated, but they were easier to track percent fish now so that they could use that spatial time gradient to unpack what was a useful piece of information. The other one is about identifying uh, the reference points and whether you want them to be uh, a linear, so you know, just a linear target like we've been discussing, or whether there's some other information that you can make hold of, so that optimum or threshold. There's less in the systems world that worry about optimum, more of them worry about thresholds, but you can actually go through that as well. Now in terms of the reference directions rather than a reference point, this is an example from Alan Bundy. And she went through, I think it was 25 different indicators in the end for multiple systems around the world and just looked at the, the concept was that whether they were no change, improving or declining. There's a red arrow somewhere. And then she'd highlight what was happening for the different systems. So under light fishing you'd get something like this where the different indicators were either not changing or improving, and under heavy fishing you had way more that were declining. And by bringing the combination of those together, you could unpack what was then happening to that particular ecosystem. You do have to be careful when you're doing that kind of trend analysis, rather than having a specific uh, point, part because of the kinds of trends and longevity that you heard about from all, and partly because different ecosystems do different things. So this is an example from Australia, where in one region the interaction between lobster and diversity was doing that, and in one region it was doing that. And immediately when you saw this in the model world and the data, you thought, well, that means that over here, you know, if you tried to use this assumption everywhere, you would have misinterpreted what was happening in this area. Now, how often do these kind of changes in response happen between different ecosystems? 
quite a lot because these two were actually only 200 kilometres apart. They were just on different sides of Bass Strait. So this was the relationship in Tasmania and this was the relationship in Victoria. So just on two, the two sides of Bass Strait. And it was because lobsters were functioning differently in the different systems. In one place they were a keystone predator that kept the system in a healthy state by keeping the urchins low. In another they were actually chopping up a whole bunch of stuff that were desirable and they were also spreading disease and a bunch of other things. So it was about understanding the dynamics of what was really happening in that system. There's also, I mentioned before that you need to think about the rules that you're connecting your performance measure and your indicator to. It's really useful to actually have a set of clear protocols to say if the indicator says this, then we need to take this particular action. Now that Initially, when managers hear that, they feel like they're overly constrained, that you're taking the decision out of their hands. So this was certainly true in the, manage in the fisheries management world when the idea of clear harvest strategies were brought into, say, in Australia. They thought, well, you're taking my ability to negotiate with the minister and the fisheries guys out of it. But they quickly learned it also took away the blame. There was one clear set of rules, you fed the information in, and it came out with the answer of, TAC needs to go up, TAC needs to go down. There was no longer the political blame throwing around who made the decision, whose fault it was that the TAC had to go down because the rules had been pre-agreed by all the participants and that include the fisheries industry as well as the NGOs, the indigenous population, the managers. So it was just a, a it took the politics out of doing fisheries management in Australia. So the key part about doing indicators in that context is you need to test not only whether the indicator is informative, but whether it in combination with the management rule is informative. So you need to test their combined performance. You might have a really informative indicator, but it's not leading to correct information going into the management rule, then it's useless. So you need to check for all the sources of error. So the paper that they were talking about the other day where we had that humans were the most one of the major sources of uncertainty in the fisheries management process. That was because we were trying to think about where could our management process go wrong? What <coughs> could the indicators be misleading? And it just kept turning out that the people's response was the part that kept tripping it all up. And that's where we learnt that from. It's okay to have an imprecise indicator as so long as the rule compensates for that. So that was my comment the other day. So long as you know that a model is biased, it's fine. It's only if you assume it's not biased and you're making an erroneous assumption that you're in trouble. This is an example of how to have a clear rule even in a qualitative situation. This is used by the Port of Townsville around coral, um, coral mortality due to turbidity and stuff like that. So they go out and they see how much coral cover there is uh, at their sampling locations and looking at the percentage of the colony and the percentage of the sample with the certain levels of mortality if it falls in this area, based on experience and modelling and a whole bunch of other things, they draw up this plot. And if it falls in this area, they don't need to do anything. If it falls in this area, they need to come back to the management group to see what the response is, whether they need to change the water quality rules or they need to change some of the shipping law rules. If it comes in here, then the review panel gets called in to start digging into why it's become so serious and what can they do to ease it off into the future. If it falls in any of these red zones, there's an immediate action. They have to stop some shipping, they have to make sure the water quality plants are meeting a certain level, they have to go to the farmers and tell them not to start putting down pest, uh, uh, fertilizers. So there's a clear set of rules and protocols that they can follow each step, which is taken tension out of what was a highly contentious area. So in summary, on the indicators front, they're actually for informing management, they're meaningless unless you can actually attach them to that reference point. There are many different ways of defining what those reference points are. That can be theory, it can be time series from historical place, points in time that people were described as desirable. They can be from spatial locations that are less disturbed and are considered desirable. But most importantly of all, there has to be, their performance has to be considered as part of that whole management package so that they can um, make sure that they're delivering true information content to the management decision process. Okay, so that's the indicator side of management decision support. Is there any questions on that? No? Yep.
Um, if you have a, an indicator for like a stack abundance that has an environmental component um, and the relationship between the stock and the environment can change through time, is there some sort of process for revisiting the indicator and evaluating if it's still useful if, if say, the species adapts? Is that done or is that... So it's not, it's even just linking them to the environment is not done in a lot of places. It's becoming more common. Um, in places like Australia, it would have to be reviewed every five years regardless. Um, there's also the, the stock assessment sus suspicion index. In basically, the stock assessment person's like, no, this doesn't seem to be working well anymore. If, particularly if you start getting trending recruitment residuals and things like that. So there are both internal triggers as being a good modeler that you should follow to make sure your relationships are still working. And then you can have the formal review process so that cyclically you do check to make sure whether it's still relevant. Particularly if there's been a large scale change, a noticeable large scale change in the environment. So a PDO shift can actually lead to what's called frame based med management where you have different indicators or different response functions assumed under the different environmental conditions. So if you're in a warm regime versus a cold regime or even different acceptable reference points in those different regimes. So if you think of anchovy and sardine, if they're in a high state, you can take a reasonable amount, but if they've ended up in a low state environmentally, then you have to be a lot more precautionary to make sure there's less stuff left to prep. Okay, so there's another side of decision support, and that's the modelling side of things. And we often see this happen in science. Uh, we deliver a tool, then we uh, need the data, and that might be missing, so you need to make sure that you've got the data to actually feed the process, otherwise you'll be like a used car salesman. So there's lots of ways that we use decision support tools. So we use them to train pilots and to do engineering and medical training. Those of us who can drive are very used to having a decision support tool right there in front of us, and that's the concept. It's about giving you little bits of useful information to help you drive along and drive along where you go. So there's lots of different ways that those decision support tools can be used and then lots of different um, resolutions, temporal resolutions. So you can have very fine scale decision support tools such as on aquaculture farms that are telling you like within a day, okay, the conditions like this you should feed, but this is the optimal time to feed your fish. They're getting to have the best metabolic returns. They really do follow those kind of very fine scale notifications of when to to do feeding and that kind of stuff. On the weeks to seasonal fronts, these tools are used to help say when to put fish in the water or where to move your fishing boat to maximise your catch and minimise your ecosystem footprint by avoiding bycatch. And in the longer term, it helps to uh, have infrastructure development in the right place to, for people to be prepared for transforming their operations. So off Tasmania, for instance, because of climate change, they'll have to change the species that they fish and the species that are in aquaculture pens, but they likely won't need to do that for 20 or 30 years, so they've got some warning about when that's happening where, so they've got that long-term planning. So all of those are the use of different kinds of models, statistic, statistical models, process models, um, big system models to help give them the information that they need on the right scales to do those decision making. It also has to be in a form that can reach the decision making, and that's becoming easier with the Internet of Things, where you can deliver it more and more through phones and other live devices. Um, I read a lot of science fiction and I was reading a book the other day where it was actually turning up on the person's shirt and in fact the mood of the person was being reflected through their shirt which was leading to a whole different depth of conversation because you could see whether the person was impressed with you or not. <laughs> so there is the potential with those live dynamic haptic a clothing that that kind of thing is in our future. Well, think of the number of watches. When I first got on the phone, when I first got on a plane, they didn't have to tell you to turn your phone off. More recently, to turn your watch off now is getting even more <laughs> surreal, I must admit. So, as an example of how to use some of these tools, this is work we're doing in Chile at the present moment, where we're using statistical tools on top of the data they automatically collect to help them warn when they've got a disease outbreak so they can be faster in response. Instead of taking weeks to realise it was happening because it had to go from a paper piece into Excel to various different Excel sheets to the high level manager, he can now instantaneously within the same day have that access to the information 
and statistically interpreted to say, yes, this is likely a real outbreak. Equally, he can automate his monthly reports and get an information on what's happening in a region or a particular area in terms of production, mortality, what are the sources of mortality, how much is going to the process of what's the value, that kind of stuff. So it can end up a bit like an operations room, which they now have in the South Pacific to track uh, fishing pressure and illegal fishing, for instance. There's also a help, way of helping interpret risk. This is also from the same project where uh, using risk models that they're being able to do planning about what would be the risk uh, of different levels of disease outbreak with the current levels of salmon that they have in the water, their current operations and that kind of stuff, so that they can do pre-planning to adjust how they're, fit, how they're growing the fish to reduce that risk. The reason that's important is in 2007 and 8 they lost $2 billion worth when there was a big disease outbreak. It just nearly almost killed the industry, so they're very conscious of that. As related to that, yep. um, what proportion, after they lost t billion, what portion of their revenues are they dedicating to this sort of risk assessment and decision support tool? <coughs> so the individual operators in-house have got in consultants to help them, but as an industry-wide cooperative exercise, they hadn't invested much. And then the Latin Investment Bank came along and said to Chile, it's one of your biggest industries, you need to be better prepared, and they've paid for us. Oh, they paid for it. Oh, yeah, so the Latin Investment Bank paid for it rather than the Chile government. And that's coming from, where is that money coming from? Chile? So the, it's, a, the, it's come as a loan to the Chilean government. They will have to slowly pay it back. But it's the, I guess, Rashid, Ru who sits behind the Latin Investment Bank? Is that the UN? Latin one. Yeah, the investment banks. You know the regional investment banks, like the Latin one? Is that the UN? Or? Yeah. It's to help get development up. So there's an Asian one, an African one, a Latin American one. So the insurance has come up way higher. Yeah. yeah, so the insurance industries themselves are probably large contributors to that because they don't want to be paying. <laughs> I can assure you that. But in that region, they lost 30,000 30, jobs overnight when the outbreak happened. So there is social pressure locally as well. Um, you can also use dynamic process models of the downscaled form of what Laurent has been talking about. So you can take the big climate models to condition regional downscaling, which in turn conditions uh, biogeochemical models that can be used to understand water quality. So this is an example from Australia where it feeds down to inform what's happening in the river that Ingrid and I live on. Um, they can use it for salmon, they can use it for water quality, for temperature, you know, swimming conditions, those kind of stuff. In the salmon world, both in Australia and Chile, we now use it to predict oxygen levels. So, in a place called Macquarie Harbour, which has a very fine seal out to the open ocean, they have started doing salmon because it's protected, but they didn't realise it didn't have very much oxygen turnover at the time. Since then, they've got the CSIRO to come in and help profile the area and to create these maps. So these are live maps that are done near real time with a projection of three to four days to say, okay, these are the red areas where it's too anoxic for the fish to be okay, the yellow to green area is where you'd be okay for the fish to be. And so they don't take the fish out necessarily if the red starts to show up above this line, which is the bottom of where the pens would sit. What they do is they stop feeding the fish, so the metabolism sinks down and the fish can ride out the anoxic area without dying, which has been pretty important. They are starting to destock the area, but this tool has helped them become more sustainable in that area and still have a productive economic outcome. And so that's the kind of decision support that you can get on operational levels. We're doing this also, we do this around the world, so this is a Chilean example, but there's actually, I think, 40, no, 30 different locations where this connectivity tool is also used. Connectivity tools are pretty common. In fact, I think there's someone in this room who does connectivity for, or did it for oil spill platforms. Yep. Not, pla not spills, just the platforms themselves. But you can look into this stuff where you, you have a point, you drop that point, and you say, where could something released at that point go? So you could pick a pathogen, you could pick a contaminant, so you can pick the behaviours up here of what you're looking at. You can pick a period of time so it does rely to have one of those hydrodynamic models sitting underneath it, but it then predicts what's the footprint of that release. So you can either do it from the release point going forward, which is how we find lost sailors around Australia now, or where the oil spill's going to go, or you can go the other way and say, if it's turned up here, where could it have come from? And that's used in Australia in law courts to do attribution to vessels. 
So whether material has fallen off a vessel and caused you know, marine debris or an oil spill, they use that to say, okay, where did that come from? You can also use it to help planning on a slightly longer time frame. So the different colours here are about connectivity and residence time. So we know that if uh, Chile puts its uh, salmon farms in this part, then if there's an outbreak in any of those locations, they'll stay in the immediate area. It won't spread through all of the farms. Whereas if there's an outbreak on these islands, where some of the newer leases are, I must admit, uh, there'll be, it spreads everywhere really quickly within a few days because the current flow is such that it sort of mixes through and everything goes past you, whereas these ones are more trapped. And so that can actually help the planning of where they want to do the stocking and how much stocking to put in the different locations. You can also use emulators. So you can take those biogeochemical models and then train a statistical emulator, like an artificial intelligence, artificial neural network, off those biogeochemical models. So you don't have to run the biogeochemical model all the time. That's very computationally expensive. can take weeks to, to run. Near real time is almost exactly what they are. Um, but the emulators run very, very quickly. So you can use a planning process where you drop in a new site. So you can just say we want to put a new site just there. And then it'll say what, and you say how many salmon you're going to put in that site. It'll come back and say, OK, the predicted level of response would be this. So it can show you how it would impact your management indicators of water quality if you put that additional farm in. And it can do it in a matter of minutes instead of weeks. So that they can start planning, OK, is it already near capacity or can we actually fit some more in so that they can have that immediate response. And the managers really sit down and use this on a day-to-day -day basis. So they don't realise they're doing modelling, they just know that they're getting a source of information to help them with their management process. It can also help conservation planning. So these are statistical models where you take presence, absence and um, number of species to help map out in areas where you can sample. So there were 400 samples taken over this region, which is the size of New Zealand, uh, sorry, of Japan. It's uh, <coughs> the Great Barrier Reef, but they couldn't exhaustively sample everywhere. They took those 400 samples and created a random forest model to say what was likely to be where on the reef so that they could plan the spatial zoning. Equally, on the west coast of Australia, they, they I think they had, you know, they had ranges of samples up the coast, but again, they couldn't exhaustively sample. But using the statistical model, they could say what was going to be where when they put down their big zones. It can also be used in the attribution side of things. So they've been looking at the trawl footprint in Australia. So fish trawling has a bad name internationally. In Australia, it actually covers less than 3% of our EEZ. So it was a way of communicating with the managers about where those hot spots were that you wanted to avoid, but what was the true footprint of where the fisheries were going, so that you could understand what was what benthic communities were happening where. It also has been used in Australia, the same kind of statistical approaches, like the species distribution models we talked about the other day, where you have the observations, you have a map of how the species temperature preferences, habitat preferences, and what that means about where they'll live. That kind of information has been used in Australia to help what's called dynamic oceans management. So instead of putting an MPA in one spot or a fishery zone in one spot, going through hundreds of pages of legislation, locking it in place forever, they said actually we're going to define it on water quality properties. So these tuners live, the different tuners live in different water quality and they want to catch one kind of tropical tuna and avoid an endangered tuna that lives in the, the colder water. So what they did was they took these maps and on a weekly basis they were updating the management zones. Right, now you can fish here because you'll avoid the, the vulnerable tuna and you'll maximise your catch of the tropical tuna. Next week you're allowed to fish over here because that's where the tropical tuna is this week. And they were literally running the management process on that live basis based on the statistical models. So as they are using it in planning too, so they can plan where to put the salmon farms, and what kind of stocking density, similarly for the prawns. For the tuna, they've got this management. And for this tuna here, they're not doing dynamic management, but they're telling the fishing fleet. So this fishing fleet captures small tuna, the small southern bluefin tuna, takes them to aquaculture pens and grows them out so that we don't have to chase them around the whole world to get them a big size that's lots of money. So, but the, the tuna have changed the location of where they are due to climate change. 
So instead of the fishing boats wasting millions of dollars chasing around the whole of the Great Australian Bight trying to find them, they use these species distribution maps to say, no, they're more likely down here. Just go there and have a look. So that they're saving the industry money as well. Beth, are those um, aligned with the scale of the infrastructure? So, or is it just like, say the processing or the aquaculture facilities were in one spot, but they were telling them to go like all the way around like Margaret River or something crazy? <coughs> So in for the long-term transformation, yes. Yeah. So in the adaptation options that I talk about tomorrow, I'll give an example of how okay. they're using that kind of board. Because I could see the industry getting super angry if they're like, um, well, cool, but... <laughs> yes and no. For the aquaculture industry, probably. Yeah. But fisheries industry in Australia, you have boats that operate in here one season and there the next season anyway. We don't cool. have very many fishing boats on okay. an in industrial scale, so we just to drive them around. Um, so the... Yes, yeah, so that's an example I'll get to tomorrow. Okay, so they've got the other problem. On a big strategic level, particularly the blue economy, you've got to navigate your way. So the kind of problem that a planning officer has in doing coastal planning, coastal management, is someone like trying to navigate this roundabout. If you understand the rules and you're in a self-organisation, you're probably okay. But I'd love to point out that there's cars not too far apart here that are going completely the opposite direction. Um, <laughs> This one does seem to be somewhat lost. But it's about trying to understand your rules and get through that. And the problem is that most managers have to do that as if they had their hands over their eyes. They don't have a lot of information. If you can imagine a whole seascape, this is the kind of level of information they directly have about the world. What the model can do is fill in the rest of the picture for them. It's not going to be in the same level of detail. It's going to have uncertainty about it, but it can give them that bigger picture. And that's the kind of modelling that I do, that helps people think about into the future what options that they want to follow. So on the simplest level, uh, you can do this with stock assessment models. So this is an example by Rich Little, um, where he had the reef habitat, he has the species, he has the fleets, and he can look at what are the different options for management of that fishery uh, based on uh, you know, how would those different management options play out so that you can have the people then discuss the outcomes about what they mean. So these different outcomes can be in terms of stock, they could be in terms of economic returns, but you can have it very clearly laid out to you what the options are and whether they perform or not. On my kind of level, I take this kind of idea of playing out the futures, but I apply it on a very much more complicated system. So you've got the climate drivers that we pull in from hydrodynamic and climate models, we play out the whole food web, but we also play out the action of all the different industries exploiting that system. And then how those people in those industries interact with each other, what their needs are on a local level in terms of infrastructure, how they lobby their government holders and the politicians and what that means for governance of these industries. Then how science and reporting from the, reporting from the industries and science can feed into that process. So if you imagine Sim Earth, a version of the world where you can play out the different options, but it's done with science instead of just on your mobile phone, then that's kind of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. On the very simplest side of things, you can play out individual fisheries questions. So we've used these in Australia to help define what fisheries look like. Uh, so in Australia, we have to pay for management out of the licence fees of the fishermen. So you want it to be management that's not so costly, so if it's low value fishery and you've got really high management costs, that's not very useful. Equally, if you've got a really risky fishery and you're not putting much into management, that's not very useful either. What we're after is a sweet spot in the middle where you're paying the appropriate amount to manage the fishery for the value of that fishery and the importance of the species in the system. So we're able to play out those different options and see what were the pros and cons of different ways of managing the fisheries. And that's then gone to help them define how they do the management. It also highlighted opportunity costs. So there's a big resistance from the fishermen in this process to pay for what they see as costly science. They couldn't see the point. Now, take note that this is a log scale. So if these guys decided that the paying for full quantitative assessments was way too costly at about 60,000 Australian dollars a year. However, if they went to these perceived cheaper ones where you use slightly cheaper methods, the opportunity costs in terms of lost catch, because they had to be more 
precautionary in the level of catch that they could take, or actually, by the time you get to here, actual loss catch, because they weren't precautionary enough in the stock decline, in total terms, the opportunity costs were twice as high, and in the orders of millions of dollars, compared to the $60,000 they were complaining about, by going to these lower tiers. And they're four times higher by the time you got to these really less quantitative tiers altogether. So by doing this, we could actually show the value of the investment in science, which then was a help to, for them to understand the importance of the management science feedback. Another place that we've used this is to think about the future under the different RCPs for the southeast of Australia in terms of fisheries and aquaculture. In fact, we've just done this for all of Australia. And the fisheries agencies of Australia want to become climate robust, so they now want this updated planning horizon, 5, 10, 50 years into the future, what does it mean for us, kind of stuff. And so what we did was we didn't just play out fisheries in this location and what was happening to the species. So we brought in the climate drivers, we played that through the species, we played that through the fisheries and aquaculture. I also added the development of this coastline, all the people that are living there, the demands that they have for space, the use of shipping, the use of energy generation, mining, so they do offshore mining in this area, all the other uses of that space. And so then we looked at, if you've got your different objectives for the whole system, social, economic and ecological, if you don't do any management of any of the system, then you're not going to meet any of those objectives. If you manage single sectors at a time, so the energy sector only worries about energy, the fishery sector only worries about fisheries, that kind of thing, then yeah, you can meet some of the objectives, but you're not going to meet all of them, particularly not at a whole of society level. If you start to manage in space or time, so you have large spatial closures or strong zoning, but you don't have any other form of management, or you close specific seasons to fishing, but you don't do other forms of management, you start to get closer to having objectives for that particular industry, but you're still not meeting all of them. It's only once you start to integrate across all of those different sectors, so have all of the different players talking to each other and having common planning tools across the different agencies, that you actually start to get... You're never going to meet all of the objectives at the level desired for everybody, but you start to meet a, a, a large majority of them. Now, the interesting thing was once you add climate change in, it acts like a huge pressure on those results. It drives it down. Not just climate change, but global change. So increasing population, increasing technology drift, all that kind of stuff. It pushes it down. So that by 2050, if you're only doing single sector management or one of these simpler management, you might as well be doing nothing because you're not getting any benefit out of it. You have to be doing this integrated management to actually be achieving things. And that kind of information gave the politicians the forewarning to say, right, we need to get our departments talking. It wasn't enough of a spur on the political cycle for them to create a new agency that does, did that link. They're still doing it by inter-agency committees and that kind of stuff, but at least they're now taking that step so that they've got that longer-term thinking coming in. You can also have nested scales. So these are, if I start that one again, this is a Ningaloo, and if you go from the reef up through the beaches to the higher regional level to the whole coast, and actually Ningaloo is influenced by what happens in the Indian Ocean. So it is on the global scale. And that's that 14 orders of magnitude that I mentioned the other day. Those are all the scales that influence what's happening on Ningaloo. So for the Ningaloo model, this is a cartoon of the contents. Remember the other day I had that wiring diagram? No one really wants to look at the wiring diagram, but this is the content. So you've got the main food web, land and sea, as well as all the different users, the services in the local area, infrastructure that they care about, their social networks, and then the political side. You also had to allow for external catastrophes, whether they're cyclones coming in, major oil spills off the rig, a price hike in fuel prices in Australia, but also actually international terrorist attacks. Now that sounds a little bit off. If you're managing for the Ningaloo coastline, why do you care what's happening in Bali? And the reason was that when Australians see, a lot of Australians go to Indonesia for their holidays, but when there's a terrorist attack over here, Australians stay home and they go to Ningaloo and the Great Barrier Reef instead. So what was happening on the international stage was influencing the pressure locally. So we have to have some scenarios where we played where there'd been a string of major uh, Indonesian terrorist attacks to see what the influence was on demand levels in Australia and so what footprint that had. In particular, when we first started, in, the people in Perth who managed the system only wanted us to care about this part. 
the direct users, the environment, because they were conservation from the conservation and fisheries departments. They wanted the food web, the direct users, and how they're managed. Once we talked to the people up in the actual area, they said, actually, these things we think are far more important, so can you please include them in the model too? So we had to expand the model to think about all those other parts. We then, sitting down with the the local industries, the local decision makers at the shires, the government state departments down in Perth, uh, and then the, the locals who are actually just living in the area, particularly the tourists. Um, we defined hundreds of scenarios to play out with this model. And it generated petabytes, actually, I think, of data. It was a huge amount across many hard disks of output. So we had to summarise it as well. So these icons summarise effectively what's going on, but what sits behind them is hundreds of indicators. And so if the arrow goes up, it meant that particular indicator increased, if it goes down, it decreased. So for the no resource sector, so there was not going to be in a scenario where they got rid of the oil and gas industry that's starting to develop up there, they found that actually the community <coughs> started to die. There wasn't enough input from tourism for the services to actually be delivered to the local community, which is very remote from the rest of Australia. They're not on the national grid, so they had to supply their own energy, so there wasn't enough demand to keep all of the generators going. And so the community itself started to decline away. What grabbed the attention of the folks up there in particular was, yes, they could add a little bit of subsistence fishing to help them along, but it was still had a pretty major environmental outcome. It was, why is this happening? And it's because of climate. Climate was is predicted to flood the major turtle nesting beaches. So while there's a lot of effort going into the turtles right now, climate could actually undermine all that and see decline in these regardless, including the corals. So the next sector, the next one that they wanted to do was that there's quite a lot of beach camping in the area and the local plans were that that would continue, but they wanted to also reflect the other things that were happening, so that they put the oil sector, oil and gas sector back in there. And there's currently six or seven platforms up there, so they were right to do that. It was a more realistic future. And they found between the camping demand and that oil and gas sector that, yes, you still got this signature of the, of the climate, and which was further enhanced for the stocks by the additional fishing that was happening, but actually, they hadn't anticipated the level of resources it would demand in terms of energy and electricity that that would require. So they did start to build an infrastructure to deliver that. They had, what had initiated the whole bit of research was that it, someone had proposed building a major resort in the park on the, demand, on the idea that the uh, tourism demand would help the local community. And while it did lead to quite a large economic increase, to the local community and the, actually the whole state's um, economic coffers. They hadn't anticipated in particular the orders of magnitude change in the demand. So tourists use a lot of water, they take showers, they don't necessarily respect the fact that these guys have to live off the aquifer, there's not a lot of natural rainfall. There's a huge energy demand from all the air conditioners versus little fans that these guys personally use. So they would have had to massively change their infrastructure to support a hotel and it would have been marginal at best of actually paying itself off. So they backed away from that. They said, yes, actually, that's not what we want. In particular, we don't like this idea of having to compete with the tourists to go to the beaches that we enjoy doing. So they came up with a compromise, which is starting to structure how they do things up there. So they still have quite a lot of camping, but you're seeing more what they call eco-lodges. So these are tents and specialised camping along. It's very high end, so there is a social decision there that they don't... They'll have camping for the poorer families and then these really high intents for the richer families. But it has actually led to some rules that are seeing a recovery in the fish stocks. Not necessarily all the iconic species yet. Some of the sharks are still nervous of having so many people around, but they are seeing a fish stock rebuilding as predicted by the model. The turtle is still long term uh, going to be impacted by climate. But it is even possible under this and the dollars that it feeds into the system, particularly given the incentives of the people visiting, to get the coral recovery, so put some of that money, particularly the oil and gas offset money, into transplanting and helping the coral grow. So it's helped them vision what they wanted from the system, and it helped that stuff that Chris was talking about, where the community started to come together to talk about the science and the understanding. So instead of immediately distrusting each other and arguing, 
They didn't have a formal committee that someone in Perth could point to, but they'd go down the pub. Every time a new planning question came up, I'd get a phone call to say, have you modelled this? And then they'd go down the pub and they'd discuss what was happening. So it's still an informal one. It has the potential to fall over because there's no formal structure, but at least it got them talking. Importantly, it showed that there was a tension between land and sea. They couldn't have a community without some development on land, but the development on land had the potential to impact the sea. And that was something they hadn't connected in their head yet. So what I tend to do is I make these big complicated models that I run, but also make little models for them to physically play with so they can learn. So we're playing out these models inside the local fishing club in Exmouth. It's a beautiful location. There was whales leaping off the end of the pier. There's all these guys who live up there all the time, so they're ignoring it while I'm looking at all these whales. Um, and they're playing with it. And all of a sudden, the head of the, the mayor sits up and says, holy fuck, what are we doing? The caravan park affects the beach? He just never thought about it. <laughs> so he immediately gets all these planners together and they start talking. So it was helped them to understand what was helping in, what was a going on in their system. It was being driven by the fact they have an ageing population so that they needed to support them rather than just have them all leave. But they had to be careful not to send themselves, go past the tipping point and put themselves in a new regime in terms of the services they needed because of the population involved. And the first hint of this was housing. They were under housing pressure because the tourists would pay more for the houses than the locals could. So that the locals were being pushed out into living in caravans or old shipping containers rather than in houses. So it's been able to help target the kind of development that they require. It was also really important to the outcome. These were some of the foremost critical factors in what was turning up. The access to the region, the roads and how easy it was to get there. The kind of housing. So this is literally the kind of houses that they were living in. With little hose pipes across the ground as their major water source. So anytime a car drove over the top, you'd hear a squawk for someone's bath had been interrupted. Uh, they used uh, open gas fires with welding gloves to do the cooking. It was a pretty. They called it Little Kenya because they co considered it they were living in third world conditions. This was also the toilets. The, the drop. How do you deal with uh, not having plumbing? So it's a drop toilet. So it just goes in a pit. And if you have thousands of people coming to visit, that can then leach out onto the reef. So it was a major concern as well. As was recreational fishing pressure. So remember all that oil and gas development. The biggest footprint of that was recreational fishing pressure. All of these young men with a lot of money and a lot of time on their hands, what else did they do up there? They went fishing. So their push fishing footprint was a thousand tons a year off the coral reef because they could just take so much in their much bigger boats. So that helped the, the companies understand why, what their footprint was, what their social license was. So they banned, they used to allow the, the rig workers to ship back the fish to their house on, on the company's dollar, basically, by backloading it on the trucks. So they banned it. They said, if you're fishing, you have to do it sustainably with catch and release, and taught them about how to do that. And that's massively reduced that footprint. Mm. So all of those little bits of information haven't had a huge transformational change on any one aspect, but they've helped inform all the little aspects of what's going up up there. Now, you hear lots of people, particularly in places like Perth, or disconnected from a live, hands-on example like that, say, why should I care about a model? Why should I trust them? They're just a model. You evil modelers can make them say whatever you want them to say. I've actually had people literally say that to me. But, so Fabio Bischetti and I sat down and started to dig into this a fair bit more. What we found was that, yes, the models were only getting the system prediction right about 75% of the time, so they weren't perfect, they weren't a crystal ball. We never pretended that they were. But if you took the kind of manager, so you heard from Chris that there was that churn that in Australia they encouraged you to move on. So if you took one of those new managers, like Chris was in the early days, who's very educated, but he's not trained on that system, he doesn't know that system, he might as well be rolling the dice as to how often he gets his management doing what he expected it to do. If you're an experienced manager that's lived in the system for a very long time, or you know that system well, you might as well toss a coin as to how often you'll get your prediction right. If you get a bunch of experienced experts together from different fields, so economics, social, uh, ec environmental, the fisheries experts, the fishermen all in the same room, like happens in the Australian 
management system, they'll get it right about two thirds of the time. So they're approaching what the model said, but they're still not quite there. Um, they keep each other honest by taking the different perspectives together. And where they get it wrong is they underestimate bifurcations, where the system doesn't respond linearly. So it has a non-linear feedback or an uncertainty in it that they had not expected. So it doesn't mean that we should always just trust models, but that we have to be honest with ourselves about what information as humans we can successfully use. So part of the reason models have a bad rep is it's lost in translation. So you have to do that translation step, like creating the pretty pictures that I had before with the arrows. It was because the arrows alone weren't enough. They had to literally be able to visualise what that world would look like. So it's a crowded space and the managers need help. They have to deal with the conflicting objectives and even going back to the first part of this talk about indicators, that's a big issue. The maths is a language that can help do that by synthesising information but you do need to bring in the different kinds of domains and the whole reason for this kind of summer school is because of our realisation you need to bring those different models together. So they can provide warnings about what's bad, so you're all that first day of my first talk was about what's going wrong, but you can also show the opportunities to help people make the best of their future so that there is a positive future to head for. And that's it. And we're probably way over time, but sorry. I guess we have many to from the